Welcome back to our course on industrial organization. I hope you had a nice uh, Christmas uh, and New Year's Eve break. Uh, first of all, of course, I want to wish you a happy uh, New Year. Uh, hopefully, uh, you did already well in the exams you had to write and perhaps you also have to write some in this week. So uh, you are well into all of these university courses and uh, Hopefully you nevertheless have some time to watch this uh, live stream. Okay, industrial organization. Uh, what we did uh, in the last lecture before the break was we finally introduced or started with our discussion of oligopoly competition. And I presented to you really the workhorse uh, models of static oligopoly games, the Cournot competition model, and already started with Bertrand uh, price competition. What we did here, and that's what you see here, uh, in terms of the Cournot model, we saw the Cournot model is a wonderful uh, model because it gives very nice uh, Predictions, it states that if you have only two firms in a market, if you have a duopoly, we will have a price which is somewhere in between the monopoly price on the one hand and the competitive price on the other hand. You had the nice uh, property that if you have more firms, if you get an additional firm, prices will go down and eventually approach the competitive price. And you also had the possibility that uh, if you have firms with different uh, kinds of costs, so different productivities, uh, even the low co uh, the high cost firm can survive and you have coexistence of firms with different cost levels. There were, however, problems with the Cournot model and one uh, is stated in this uh, slide here. The problem is the Cournot model always assumes that uh, there is some market clearing uh, mechanisms. Firms are passive in the sense that we do not uh, explicitly account for price setting. And that was the critique of uh, Joseph Bertrand who stated that once you will have this kind of price setting by firms, you get dramatically different uh, results. I don't want to go through this uh, uh, example here, that's what we already did, but just want to jump on a few slides to just look where, where we have been here to this slide, uh, where we first of all noticed that uh, there will be this undercutting for instance, if you start uh, from the Cournot price uh, and uh, it will not, cannot be an equilibrium in such kind of, of pricing game where firms set prices because you, or each firm always has an incentive to undercut the other as long as the price is above marginal cost. And uh, as we saw, the unique equilibrium will then be that both firms charge a price equal to marginal cost. I also mentioned these auction theories where uh, Klemper states and other authors uh, show that also equilibrium and um, mixed strategy exist, but that's just uh, an addendum. We don't go into the details here. Yeah, uh, the problem is, however, or, or that that's a very interesting result, of course, and uh, that gives us, in a sense, a headache because uh, we like the Kuno model and, in particular, its results and predictions so much, but at the same time, we get this result, and that's uh, this result is called the Bertrand paradox, and uh, that's why we want to go or inspect in more detail uh, what the, the assumptions are on which this result uh, is based. And that's what we already saw. I think you'll see that from the lines I added uh, the last in the last lecture, is that it assumes that you have unlimited capacities. I will get back to that in two slides. It assumes that you have homogeneous products. We will uh, examine product differentiation in the next but one chapter. It assumes that you have a one-shot game and not uh, repeated and super games, something which uh, gives rise to collusion and which we did in the undergraduate a competition policy course. And uh, all firms are assumed to have identical and they have constant average and marginal costs. We will look into these uh, or, or we will uh, look into uh, what the outcome is if we uh, get rid of these kind of, of uh, uh, assumptions in a sense, okay? Uh, if we uh, stop to make these assumptions. You get then two-stage capacity games. That will be the main topic of today. Uh, differentiated products, that's what I already told you, will be uh, 
the topic in the chapter on horizontal product differentiation and all the other things I already told you. Uh, I think I don't need to show you this, but now I'm going to this uh, first assumption, which was the assumption that all firms have identical marginal and, and average costs. Now we allow for different marginal costs. So we allow for a high cost firm and a low cost firm. The high cost firm is firm two, the low cost firm is firm one, low, firm one has lower cost than firm two. And what uh, should immediately be clear and what I will, uh, I'm going to show you in, in a second is that in the equilibrium we will have only one firm being active and this is the low cost firm, firm one here, and uh, firm two will not produce anything but it's, uh, firm two is important in the sense that its cost level determines uh, an upper limit for the price of firm one. In formal uh, uh, terms, this means that uh, our firm one, our low cost firm, maximizes its profit by choosing its price P1, taking into account C2. In formal terms, this is a, uh, an optimization approach where you have a constraint. However, this is not a Lagrangian, even though we have a Lagrange multiplier here. So here you just have the profit of, of firm one, and here you have the constraint. This is a so-called Kuhn-Tucker approach with complementary slackness. Uh, because here, uh, in, in many cases, uh, this, this uh, constraint will not be satisfied. For instance, if, if uh, P1 is smaller than C2, then lambda will be zero. This is the complementary slackness. Either P1 uh, is equal to C2, then this constraint is zero, then lambda will be uh, will have actually a, a negative value, I think. Uh, and uh, if uh, if P1 uh, minus C2 is negative, lambda will be uh, a zero, okay? Uh, f actually, th this would be a bit complicated in formal terms. We did that at some length, such Kontaka approaches in the, in the economics of regulation course. Here it's rather simple and straightforward because this first term here is just a profit, a standard monopoly profit, and what you are doing is you just derive the monopoly price, okay? given this uh, cost level C1, and then you get the monopoly price C1, and this constraint just tells you if your price, your monopoly price, is lower than C2, you just don't have to take into account this constraint because your, your rival has so high costs that you even can charge a monopoly price, it doesn't matter that uh, in terms of economics inno of innovation, this would be related uh, to the case of a drastic innovation, okay, then you would also not be not affected by the cost level of your rivals. So if you have a, a cost level so low that your monopoly price is below uh, the price of your, uh, the cost level of your rival, you just ch uh, ch uh, charge a monopoly price. If, however, your monopoly price would be above uh, the cost level of your rival. Of course, you don't charge a monopoly price because the rival will undercut you and you don't have any business, but you charge a so-called limit price. And the, the upper limit here, that's what we derived above here, is the cost level of the rival. And here we assume simply a tiebreaker rule that if you charge a price as a low cost firm equal to the cost of the high cost firm, you will get all the business. Otherwise, uh, this just makes notation easy. Otherwise, we would have always to write that P1 is equal to C2 minus some epsilon. So you clearly would have an incentive to undercut this rival so that you get the whole uh, business. Okay. And for simplicity, we just assume if we have uh, firms of different cost levels, uh, uh, the, the low cost firm can just charge a price equal to the cost of the high cost firm and then make all the business. This is just a, our tie-breaking rule. Okay, so you, it's rather straightforward and that's very similar to, to our setup in economics innovation for those who took those, this course. And it should be rather straightforward. The important thing here is compared to Cournot, here you see if there's only a marginal difference uh, in the cost levels, you, we will have the, always the fact that only the low cost firm is active. And in a sense, uh, a virtual competition leads to productive efficiency because always only the low cost firm uh, uh, produces, even though it's not produces at, at its own marginal cost, but at its rival's marginal cost. Okay, that's, that's what we have. Another set of, of modifications here uh, is, uh, 
what we come to now is that with the capacities, okay? Uh, the Bertrand model makes clear that competition in prices is very different from competition in quantities. And so this is a challenge to uh, the Cuno approach, of course, because many firms seem to set prices. Some one must set prices and there are not so many auctioneers around. And uh, however, uh, even though there are problems with the Cuno approach, there are also problems with the Bertrand approach. And that's what we, we turn to now, because in order for this undercutting argument to work, uh, we all, uh, always have to have the result that at this equilibrium with price equal marginal cost, both firms need enough capacity to fill all demand at this price, okay? So if marginal costs are 10, I think that was our example, uh, and, and we could even go back to this example here, 10, and we had then uh, some, some uh, I think, I don't know what, uh, what we assumed in terms of, of output uh, we have then. The point is, uh, here, what, what you have is that in order to have these undercutting stories, uh, suppose the output would be, the total output would be 40, uh, even though you only have at the equilibrium an output of 20 each firm, in order to, for these, for these undercutting uh, story to work, you have to have the full 40 in terms of capacity in order to be able to undercut your rival, okay? And the point is, in equilibrium, you get only half of the market, that is, half of the uh, capacity is sufficient, but, in, but you need uh, the whole capacity, the whole market capacity, the whole market demand at price equal marginal cost uh, uh, equilibrium uh, in order to, 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 for this undercut story to work. Therefore, you have huge excess capacity, okay? You have uh, you have 100% excess capacity because your capacity is double what you actually sell. And that's an that's important point here. And uh, at least uh, if capacity is, is, uh, is important, so think of our vaccinations, you need to build up uh, plants in, 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 uh, in, in Marburg, uh, for instance. And uh, of course, it's very expensive to build up capacity. And if you don't need it, uh, in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the first place, why would you build up? And of course, if you then don't have so much capacity, the world is completely different as we are going to show right now. Okay, so what we need to look into now is the choice of capacity. And the interesting thing is, and that's what we are going to show, if you look into choosing capacity, you get a model which is very much like choosing output in the Cournot model. So what we will present you now is really a Cuno result in a model where we have a capacity choice and then firm set prices. Of course, and that's a final remark uh, to product uh, homogeneity. If uh, products are not identical but, but uh, slightly differentiated, uh, we, we get uh, less intense price competition, but we will get back to that later. Okay, so what we look into now is a world in which firms choose capacities, in which therefore capacity is what is called endogenous. And our setup is again uh, the, the simplest possible in order to address the question we want to answer. First of all, again, we have only a duopoly, two firms. They sell a homogeneous, these firms sell a homogeneous product and they have endogenous capacities. And the structure of, uh, of the game is as follows. You have a, a, a two-stage game where in the first stage, firms choose capacities and then after having chosen capacities, they choose prices and these prices might potentially differ, okay? And if you have a two-stage game, it's always the, game, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the case that you solve that, or mostly, uh, if at least it's, if it's one under certainty, uh, you, almost, uh, you, you always solve it backwards, uh, that is, uh, you use a so-called recursive solution. What does it mean? You first 
solve the last stage of the game, the pricing stage. That is, uh, and in the pricing stage, you then have the capacities given and look into what are the optimal prices. And then you uh, substitute the optimal prices in the profit function, get the so-called re reduced profit function, where no more pr prices do no longer appear, only capacities, and then you determine the optimal capacity. And uh, as I already told you, the decisions on capacities and prices are sequentially, but firms decide on each of these two variables simultaneously. That is, uh, they first both at the same time choose the capacities. Moderna chooses uh, its production capacity and uh, biotech uh, chooses its product, uh, uh, production capacities. And then in the second stage, after both have built their plants and know uh, the capacities, uh, we choose the prices. Okay, hopefully this is clear so far. What is very important here then is what is called the rationing rule. Uh, I now move uh, to another example. Uh, suppose you have two hotels, okay? Oh, unfortunately, you, I could not even go skiing this, uh, this, this winter break. Uh, usually I go skiing. Uh, to, to somewhere near the Alberg, St. Anton Al um, Alberg, and there you have hotels, many of them, and, and they might, uh, they have a certain capacity, okay? And the, the point is, uh, very often, uh, at least if it's not Corona pandemic, uh, it will be the case that uh, one of the, the of the, of the, of the, uh, and in particular, it's typically the cheaper one, the cheaper of the hotels is booked out. Okay, and you have then to take uh, or to go to the other hotel. And of course, even if you have uh, two uh, identical hotels uh, and with a certain capacity each, uh, if one chooses a very low price for whatever reason, the other firm might choose a higher price. And then rationing might be important because why? Yeah, because everyone, uh, all the people who want to go skiing, want to go to the cheaper hotel. The question is then, so all consumers want to buy from the low price firm. The question is then, uh, who gets then a, 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 a room in the low price hotel and who has to go to the high price hotel? Even though these uh, hotels are otherwise, uh, otherwise uh, uh, identical, okay? So this is possible because capacity, at least capacity of the one firm is lower than uh, demand and uh, one of the two firms might uh, choose a higher price. Okay, so, the, the, but that's a rather general question. Uh, in many instances, a rationing uh, might uh, uh, arise. Suppose uh, you have a meat price premises so or a, a, a ceiling on, on the, the rental rates of your apartment. Then, of course, uh, typically, if the market uh, mechanism is not allowed to clear a market, you will ha have rationing. You will have more demand uh, or, or more people who want to have uh, a s certain rooms. Okay, and the question is then, who is served? Who gets the room? And there are, of course, many, many rationing mechanisms, many so-called rationing rules. Uh, we know, uh, for instance, yeah, what, what do we know from, from the seminars? You know, in former times, we had first come, first serve rules uh, in, in terms of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Wohnungsmarkt of, 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 uh, of, of uh, apartments. Uh, it might be just that uh, the, 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 the renter goes for, for the appearance, okay? If you have good looks, you get the hotel, uh, the, the, the apartment. If you don't have, you don't get it, okay? So there are many uh, different rationing rules, might also be discrimination here, but we are looking for, uh, in a sense, for rationing rules uh, in terms of their economic properties, okay? Uh, and what does this mean? We look into, uh, two kinds of rationing rules, and, and uh, these are efficient and random rationing uh, rule. Uh, and you will see in a minute what this uh, exactly means. Efficient rationing just means that uh, if you have a low, uh, a low price hotel, the, the people with the highest willingness to pay get the rooms. Random rationing would mean that people just 
randomly get the rooms, okay? Uh, suppose, and I think we have that in uh, one of the problems of our assignment, of our problem set, uh, people would just make phone calls uh, to, to, uh, to book, to make their reservation, to book the hotel room. And uh, might be in the two ways. It might be that the people with the highest willingness to pay for the room first make the calls and therefore get uh, the cheap uh, 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 room in a cheap hotel. It might also be uh, that this is completely random and unrelated uh, to their willingness to pay. Okay. Hopefully, this all becomes clearer in the next uh, four slides where I try to explain to you what these rationing rules mean in terms of residual demand. What it means in terms of which demand does the firm face which chooses a high price. Okay? So, assume we have a continuum of consumers. Uh, with unit demand and different reservation prices. So these are uniformly distributed over uh, 0 to, to 100 and you have some density of this. Uh, so we have a very, very simple demand function. It would be just xp, just 100 minus p is this 100 different types times capital N, which would be just then the total number. If uh, capital N is 10, you would have 10,000 uh, consumers at, at most, okay, and the maximum willingness uh, to pay still for a hotel room would be 100, for instance. Okay, uh, and uh, so assume that firm 1 is the low uh, price firm, charge is a lower price, and firm 2 is a high price. And we want to uh, look into what the so-called residual demand of these high price firms. Okay, hopefully this is clear so far. Uh, so under what circumstances will we get rationing? Now we have our hotel, this has a certain capacity, a certain number of rooms, which we denote as K1. And we get rationing, so uh, uh, remember we have P1 is smaller than P2. So, so, so uh, hotel 1 charges 80 euro per room, hotel 2 charges 100 euro per room. Okay? So everyone and uh, all consumers know that. And everyone wants to have, of course, uh, 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 room in this low price hotel. Okay. Now, under what circumstance will there be rationing? It will be rationing if uh, the demand at a price of 80 euro, which is nothing else as this, is higher when the capacity. So it has a capacity of 50 rooms, this hotel, but demand at a price of, of say, uh, 80 is 150. Okay. Then there will be ration. Okay. Th that's what we have. The question is then, uh, what is our rationing rule? And we assume here, or first of all, I want to explain to you the so-called efficient rationing rule. That means that the consumer with the highest reservation prices are served. Whether this is, whether this is uh, in any uh, way plausible is another uh, uh, question. Okay, But uh, think in terms of first come or first serve. People with the highest willingness to pay might be the first to, to really go to this hotel. Okay? okay, so what we assume is that consumers buy in order of reservation price and appear at the hotel uh, or book in the hotel at the, in the order of the reservation price. So how does then this so-called residual demand function of firm 2 look like? And this is then rather straightforward and, and easy, hopefully. Uh, hopefully this, this is uh, clear. It's simply total demand minus K1 minus the capacity minus uh, the, uh, the supply of, uh, of the firm, firm 1. Okay? So XP2 is nothing else as suppose P2 is this 100, uh, the, this price the other hotel charges, and X of P2 would be just X of 100, how many people are going for a hotel if the price is 100, minus how many are already served, and these who are served are the ones who get a, hotel, a room in the low price hotel. Okay, and of course this applies only uh, if uh, the demand of or if the capacity of the low price hotel is smaller than uh, it, it's uh, it, the, the demand for for its product. Otherwise, if uh, it has a higher demand at its own price, no no, no uh, demand will be left for for firm two. 
And here just in order to illustrate that a little bit better, I gave you a linear example. Uh, N is 100 minus P2. Okay, it's just uh, this, this simple example here, minus K1. Okay, I think it's probably best to illustrate that. So this would be uh, the aggregate demand curve for the two firms. Okay, and then you have firm one. Uh, firm one having this capacity K1, or hotel one, okay? Now, uh, what we know is that from all these consumers here, you see the different consumer. Here is this consumer with the highest willingness to pay of 100. Here you have the consumer with the lowest willingness to pay. And all of the consumer with the highest willingness to pay, they get a room in the low cost hotel. Okay. So what is straightforward then, uh, these are not part or these consumers, or I think I just should move on. Uh, and, and, uh, Suppose this is a price uh, our, our firm one uh, charges. And what we know is that all consumers above uh, this vertical intercept here will no longer be available to firm two because they already buy or book at uh, the low cost firm at firm one. Okay? And now how do you get this vertical intercept? Actually, you could just derive uh, the, the, from this demand function, uh, the demand function, the demand curve, that is the inverse demand function. So you have X, XR here of P2. I just don't write it down uh, because I just get problems then otherwise. Uh, plus K1, put that on the other side here, uh, is equal to N times 100 minus P2, and, and then uh, would uh, just, I think, divide then by n, and uh, divide then, oh, I think I even have shown you that, or I have uh, calculated that in, I have calculated that in more detail here uh, in, in uh, already before, because otherwise I have trouble here with the space. So this is the first step. And then I just uh, rearrange it, divide by, by the EN here, uh, get 100 minus P2 on the other side, solve for P2 and get then this here. And I think I just should write that down if I manage to do that, 100 minus XR. So P2 would be 100, oops. P2 would be 100 minus XR over N, XR over N minus K1 over N. And now what you immediately see for, for uh, X, X uh, equal to zero, you get this vertical intercept, okay? And now what you already see is, this is just then a, a, a line here, this, uh, inverse demand uh, function, this demand curve, is just a line which has the slope, the same slope as the aggregate demand curve, which is nothing else than 1 over n. Okay? And so, oh, I just was tempted to draw it by hand, but I already have drawn it. So here is what you see uh, is a residual demand curve. It just shifts by k minus 1 to the left, and here the point is, of course, this would also be equal to K1 by construction. Okay, this is the same, uh, this is the same distance as this distance here. Okay, and this is then the residual demand, and that's what you get uh, in terms uh, of, of residual demand with efficient rationing rule. And now you already see why this is important, because now you see uh, our firm two, our second total, it's a monopolist on its residual demand that it might have, and that's actually the question, an incentive to charge a price which is higher than P1. Suppose P1 is just a market clearing price from uh, two would, uh, from one would set uh, where price is such that uh, you get uh, this price given you uh, use up all your capacity so that Q1 is equal to K1 and Q2 is equal to K2. If that would be the price, the question is always, would firm two also choose the same price? And that's actually our question. Okay. And now what we already uh, saw and what I already explained here, 
only consumers with the reservation price smaller than this expression here, 100 minus K1 over N get the low price product one, okay? Only these, these guys here, get the, they get the good deal with the low price and all others get the other price. And as you will see in a moment, this maximizes uh, consumer surplus. Uh, that's what you can only uh, well understand once we look into the alternative, so-called uh, proportional rationing rule or random rationing rule. Random is just because the rationing is unrelated to the willingness to pay. With the efficient uh, rationing rule, it was clear. Rationing is always such that you first give the product from the low cost or low price firm to the people, to the consumer with the highest willingness to pay. Okay, and here you just give them by chance. And now let's see what, what this means. So each consumer with a, so that, that's the essence of random rationing. Each consumer with a willingness to pay higher uh, than the price of the low price firm gets the unit output with the same uh, probability. And uh, if I think our previous example was some, I think I gave you even an example here. If uh, demand at the price uh, which is set by the firm is 60, and if the capacity of this, of this firm is 20, it would be just one third uh, your probability. So demand at this price is 60, uh, capacity is 20, your uh, probability as a consumer would be one third that you get the product. Your probability that you don't get the product, of course, is then two thirds. Okay, And that's uh, that the, the chance that the firm two gets a consumer with a high willingness to pay. So the probability that an arbitrary consumer with the willingness to pay greater than P2 now has not obtained the product from firm one is just the converse probability, okay? Uh, the remaining part, which would then be just uh, one minus this here, and this would be then in our example, would be two thirds. If K1 over X is one third, uh, X minus K1 over X would be two thirds, okay? And the residual demand then is rather easy because, again, this residual demand of firm two is just the total demand, the aggregate demand you have at this price. Suppose at this price you have uh, uh, 120 consumers uh, at this price, and if the, uh, if, the, if, the, if the probability then is, is two thirds, it would be just uh, this 120 times this probability. Okay. That's what we have here. And this probability, of course, is determined, and that's why I, I changed its color to red, by the price of firm one. Okay, this is nothing else than aggregate uh, demand, given this price times the probability that these people are still available. Okay, that these people, these consumers not, have not yet bought. And again, of course, this only holds if there is really rationing if at uh, the price, the low cost, low price firm charges, uh, demand is higher than capacity. And again, I have an example here, which is uh, pretty much the same, same, same uh, linear demand function, aggregate demand function as previously. And now here you just have your, your, your probability that these uh, consumers were not served by the other firm. Okay? Should be clear, again, we have an example on that. Okay, uh, yeah, now I just also want to, to draw that. Uh, and for simplicity, I just assume that this, this density of consumers, this number of consumers is, is just one, which makes life easier. And then what you see here, this is then just here, in this case, uh, denoted with, with an n equal to one, same expression as previously. Now again, we have a price equal to one. Remember previously, uh, we just uh, went up here, okay, and said everyone above here gets it, okay? But now it's different. Now it's different, now we know, uh, given uh, that we have this price here, suppose this was one third here, uh, and now again, uh, I, this is the same here, this is again K1, this distance here. Okay, this distance here is the same as, as this distance, okay. Okay, this, this distance is the same, and now, uh, what, what, what's, uh, what's the probability that you get 
as firm two, as a high price firm, that you get one guy here. Of course, it's actually two thirds, okay, uh, in, in our previous example. And the interesting thing is here, what you just can do, and now this is just, oops, uh, this here is now nothing else than 100 minus P1 minus K1. This is just our, our actually, it's the inverse of, of our probability in a sense. Uh, it's just those who didn't get uh, something from the other, okay? And uh, the, the point is this, this green line just, and this is geometry, this is actually what we apply here the, in, in English, I think it's called intercept theorem. In German, it's Strahlensatz. This, uh, this, this line just divides the total demand here in uh, actually that would be our two thirds and this would be our one third. Okay, it just divides uh, the, the, the aggregate demand firm in, in uh, demand uh, in, in two parts. And uh, we know just these guys here somehow have got something uh, from, from the rival, but uh, here these, uh, these have not been served. Okay, in terms of the willingness to pay. Yeah, hopefully this is clear. I have a, a lot of uh, explanation here in the notes. Uh, so what is clear, what, what should be clear is just, of course, you can always calculate just here the, 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 the slope uh, of, of the demand curve. I think I have even uh, written... No, I didn't write it down here. But the, the slope of the demand curve would be just uh, uh, the, the inverse of that here, of, of the probability, okay? Uh, of course, here, uh, the slope of the, the aggregate demand curve would be one. And in our example, you know the probability would have been two thirds uh, we had here uh, in a previous example. And therefore, our our slope of the of the demand curve would be just uh, uh, 3 over 2, which is just uh, if you just invert this guy here, okay? Because you, you have to solve it for P2, and then you get uh, just uh, uh, the, the inverted value. Yeah, and the, the point is here now, and that's the important part here. What does this mean uh, in terms of our incentive or, the, or in terms of our who gets our consumers of the identity of the consumers who get the product. Previously, only the high guys got it. But now suppose here our firm, our firm uh, two charges this price. Okay, then of course, all guys here in the residual demand will get the product. Okay, the others have got something. But the important point here, here uh, this guy here, for instance, this guy here, with this willingness to pay, which is well above P1, might not have uh, got the product, okay? Uh, she might not have got the product, even though her willingness to pay might be higher than someone who got this product, okay? Because people and down to here, to, to the price P1, actually can have got the product. And that's uh, what, what is, in a sense, in the, in the remainder here, okay? Here, of course, everyone with a willingness to pay higher than P2 gets the product then, because that's exactly how it, it, it's contract, uh, constructed. But these other guys, uh, they, they might have not got it, uh, even though someone else with a price as low as P1 got it. And that's why uh, the random rationing rule or the proportional rationing, rationing rule does not uh, uh, maximize consumer uh, surplus in general. Okay, I think, so the important point here is that uh, you understand these, these, these rationing rules, okay, uh, and are able to, to derive. Hopefully it was clear. If there are any questions, we can uh, briefly discuss that in WebEx, and in particular, uh, it should become uh, clearer once, we, we, uh, once you, you solve for, uh, or one, once you, you do the, the, the problems in the uh, tutorial clause. Yeah, uh, now once we have, uh, oh, perhaps I make a short break here 
and, and ask for questions because these rationing rules are really important. And then I move on to explain to you uh, the, the, so the, the famous Krebs-Scheinman uh, model, uh, which in a sense uh, came, came to the rescue of the Cournot model. And you will see why the efficient rationing rule is so important. So uh, a short break here and I ask for questions. Yeah, back again. There was a brief question in the in the chat about uh, the demand function I used here. Uh, it's just a standard demand function, very simple one. Uh, just, I just explained it in very or introduced it in a very complicated way. Uh, this is just a way that you that you can really not more nicely interpret this demand function as a result of say the unit demand and actually remember our our hoteling or our spatial model where we also had these different uh, consumers distributed over this this unit line okay uh, each of the consumers having a, uh, the same demand in a sense but a different willingness to pay due to different transport costs that's uh, very similar here uh, the the transport cost would be just very, very different here. Suppose there is someone located at zero with, uh, and with a maximum willingness to pay of 100 and it goes 100 kilometers and uh, you have a cost of uh, one euro per kilometer. So uh, the, the guy located at 100 kilometer distance has a willingness to pay of zero, okay? And you get a continuum again. Hopefully this is uh, clear now. Okay, but now, uh, back to our krebs scheinman model. Okay, now we look into a model where we endogenize uh, capacities and where we assume that uh, rationing is according to the eff efficient rationing rule. And what you will see is actually that the equilibrium of this price setting in the second stage, which is nothing else than a Bertrand model then, with homogeneous products is identical to a Cournot duopoly. Okay, you get the Cournot outcome as uh, the result of a two-stage game in which firms choose in a first stage uh, uh, capacities and in a second uh, game prices. Again, I use this same linear uh, demand example and now I just uh, assume that this capital N I had in a previous uh, or in the introduction of the rationing rule is equal to one. So two-stage game. In the first stage, uh, we uh, assume that there is a choice of capacities. We assume that capacity uh, has some unit cost. If you want to have a unit of capacity, it costs you some CO, which is something between uh, 75 and 100. So we only look into a simplified version of the krebs scheinman model because uh, in, in, uh, if we were to allow for general capacity costs, we would have to, to look into uh, uh, equilibria in, in, in mixed strategy and so on. This is uh, too advanced for this course. Okay, so uh, you will see in a moment why this is an important assumption here. Uh, in a second stage, we have Bertrand competition and we assume that there are no production costs in a second stage uh, up to the capacity limit, but then uh, they are just uh, 75, of course. So you can produce every, uh, in, in terms, if you have a capacity of 10, you can produce in a second stage up to 10 uh, units at a, price, at a cost of zero. Okay, now again, our solution is now again recursive in several steps. Uh, this is, our, is a more, a bit more involved because we first want to derive an upper limit for capacity. You will see in a minute why this is important. Uh, but what is clear here, given this very high cost of capacity, uh, we, we know that the, the, the volume of capacity or the capacity chosen will be limited, okay? Uh, and so the capacity costs, of course, can never be higher than the profit of a monopolist without a capacity limit. This would be just a profit in the second stage in which capacity is costless. So in the second stage, uh, remember our, our uh, demand was 100 minus, minus X or 100 minus P, depending on whether you refer the demand function or the inverse demand function. So the monopoly price is 50. The quantity would also be 50. So your profit would be, your gross monopoly profit would be 2,500. Now, if you have 
capacity cost of 75 per unit and you can have a maximum profit of 2,500, you certainly will never uh, choose a capacity which is higher than 2,500 than, uh, than uh, over, over 75, which would be 33.3 uh, uh, in a sense. Okay, So this is really an upper limit and it's clear that you will never uh, reach it because it would be nonsense. You would make profit of zero, but you will see this upper limit already is sufficient for, for our purposes. Just we need, uh, you will later on see, we need some kind of limit here. In a second stage, we have this Bertrand Nash price equilibrium and each firm sells capacity at the market clearing price. That's what we are going to show right now. Okay, uh, that, that is, we will show that in the second stage, they will just choose a price which is just market clearing and the market clearing price given capacity firm 1 chooses a capacity of K1, say 10, firm 2 chooses a capacity of 15, then they would choose a price of 10, 15, uh, 25 of 75. Okay? Then uh, the, in order to show that, uh, uh, we, we have to show that firm 1 has no incentive to sell at a price which is higher than this price P star if firm um, 2 charges this market clearing price. That's what we are going to do right now. Of course, the firm will never sell at the price which is lower than the market clearing price. Suppose here uh, you have this total capacity of 25 and uh, you can sell everything at a price of 75. If you uh, uh, if you sell it at a price of 50, of course, you, 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 your demand is not increased or your sales are not increased because your capacity constraint, you cannot have sell more than these 10 units here. And therefore, you would uh, reduce your profit if you sell at a price which is lower than P store. But then the, now the question is what we want to look in. Do you have an incentive to sell at a higher price than is P store? Okay, that's what we are looking into. And therefore, we need our residue demand firm on which I'm a monopolist here as firm one. And again, here you see, this is our efficient rationing. Just our aggregate demand curve minus the capacity the low price firm puts to the market. And the low price firm is here then, of course, a firm, firm two, which charges a market clearing price. And uh, as I already uh, just showed you, you will never charge a lower price. The question is, Will you want to? Ha will you have an incentive to charge a higher price? Then the optimal price uh, of uh, firm one, given quantity x one, okay, uh, would be of course p one uh, hundred minus x one uh, k two. So you will then, of course, now you can, of course, you can choose a higher price, but that would mean you just choose a lower quantity. The question is here, we put it in terms of quantity. Will you want to sell a, a quantity which is lower than your K1? Okay. And of course, if you sell a, a certain quantity, you will always charge them this price P1. Okay. Uh, now, the profit of deviating uh, for firm one uh, is, is the following. Of course, now you choose uh, this X1. And if x1 is smaller than k1, your price will be small, will be higher than, than, than this p saw price. Okay? And the question is, will you have an incentive to do that? And that's what we are going to show right now. And the point is here, we just maximize profit and or, or we just look at the first derivative of the profit function with respect to this output x1. And uh, this is just here multiplied by x1, so you get 100 minus 2x1 minus k2. And what we are showing here is that this is greater than zero. Because why? Because here k1 is, uh, and here we use our, or here we need our upper, upper bound on, on capacity. We know that k2 will be smaller than 33.3. Uh, and x1 can never be higher than 33.3. Actually, it will be lower. And But however, if you substitute here 33.33, it would be 3 times 33.3 here, x1 and k2. It would be just exactly 100. But we know this is an upper limit which will not be reached. Wherefore, we know that uh, these two expressions are smaller than 100. Therefore, we know that the whole expression 
d pi 1 uh, over dx1 is greater than 0. But what does that mean? Given you have a capacity, given you have an output x1, which is lower than, than, than this 33.3, uh, you always have an incentive to increase output. Okay? Because this would increase profit. This is what, tells, uh, what this sign tells you. Okay? Given you, have, you are at an output lower than 33.3, you will always have an incentive to increase uh, output. But that already proves our, our proposition, namely that you always will uh, use up uh, your capacity. Okay? You always will use up capacity. Decreasing x1 below k1 is not profitable because you will always have uh, an increasing profit if you increase x1 as long as x1 is lower than 33.33 and that's always the case. Uh, and therefore the increasing if you don't want to increase x1 below k1, that means you don't want to increase your price above p stop. And in stage two, both firms therefore make full use of the capacities they built up in stage one, okay? And charge a market clearing price, okay? So we know there is an upper limit on capacity. We know firms will use up all capacity uh, we, we, we have built up in stage one and now we just have to determine what is the level of capacities we will choose in stage one. Taking into account the optimal prices in stage two, remember this optimal price in stage two was just 100 minus the capacities uh, in, uh, built up in, in, in stage one. That was the optimal price. So what we have here, this P star is just 100 minus K1 minus K2 minus C0 uh, times then this would be of course your capacity but you know this is equal to to uh, your output in the last stage but this now is put into we maximize here by choosing our that's supposed to, to 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 mean ki here we just maximize by choosing not our price because that is what we do in stage two we maximize our capacities but this is a standard kuno optimization problem it's the exact Cournot reduced form. In Cournot, we would just write uh, Q1 and Q2, in, in, uh, this, uh, uh, or X1 and X2, uh, uh, compared to, to this, this uh, notation here. Okay? So, what we have shown here, or actually not we, but uh, Krebs Scheinman in a, one of the most cited papers in, in industrial organization, is that capacity choice and subsequent price competition lead to Cournot outcome, okay? And now we, this came really to the rescue once we are in a world in which capacities matter, and now think uh, in terms of our awake sense, you see uh, it's rather sad that capacities matter. Uh, the BioNTech just cannot uh, uh, pull out or, or, or turn out, churn out uh, millions or billions of doses overnight, okay, capacity constraints matter. And in these industries, if these capacity constraints matter, you actually uh, are back in the world of Kurnu, okay? Of course, that result is not robust uh, or perfectly robust. You will see, once we look at a different rationing rule, in particular the, the random rationing rule, the proportional rationing rule, uh, it, you might have some uh, more incentive to, to deviate uh, and, and charge a higher price than we have with the efficient rationing rule. We will have an example in the problem set where you can calculate that, but still uh, the 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 intensity of competition is limited, okay? Even though if these results do not hold perfectly, you certainly get a deviation from the Bertrand paradox and you will get prices which are well above marginal cost if capacities match, uh, 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 if capacities matter, uh, matter. So the general message is that krebs scheinman saved Cunot, even though we might not always get exactly the result we know if capacity matters, uh, the equilibrium in a one-shot game with endogenous capacity and price setting by firm yields a result which is much closer to a Kono uh, with prices well above marginal cost. There is another thing, of course, if there are imperfect information about cost functions of 
competitors, prices might be a signal of costs. Uh, you might get very different world. Perhaps we get back to that uh, once we uh, introduce uh, asymmetric information below, but I don't know where we will ma make it. The important point is here that uh, we, in a sense, get back to the Cournot model. Now we can evaluate both the Cournot and the Bertrand model better. If capacities don't matter, think of software, for instance, you would uh, be much more uh, uh, tempted to, to, to uh, think that we get more to price equal marginal cost, uh, whereas even though there we have another problem that prices would have to be zero then. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we, we in a sense save the Cono model uh, and because this obvious shortcoming of not having a solution for uh, the in or the passivity of firms in terms of charging or setting a price is solved in the Cripshine model. Okay, that's actually the part I wanted to tell you about the static models before I move on to the dynamic games and in particular the Stuckelberg model uh, with the Stuckelberg leadership model. I will make another short break here. Okay. Dynamic games and first and second move advantages. In this chapter, uh, we will introduce uh, timing in, in more detail. Uh, remember, in the intro, uh, perhaps I could uh, check or I could, could move back to, to the starting point we, we had here. Once we started with uh, the static games, we were also discussing here timing. Okay. What we did here in, in, in this, this chapter on, on static models and the Cuno and the, and the, and the Bertrand model, we assumed that we had simultaneous move games. Even in our uh, krebs scheinman model, both firms uh, took their capacity decision at the same time and they later on took the pricing decision at the same time. That's what we are going to, to change right now. Now we allow for... Uh, for, for sequential moves. And that's what we are doing in particular in the Stuckelberg uh, model where uh, there is an asymmetry in the sense that there's one firm which moves first and can make or, uh, commitments. I will get back uh, to what this means later. And then the other firm uh, choose or, or moves uh, second. And you will see that this has very important strategic uh, uh, consequences in a sense. Okay. Uh, and in particular, it also has consequences on the structure of, of competition and, on, and it opens up a full road of strategic behavior on the leader. And this leader might also be thought of as what is called later on the incumbent. And, uh, and we will discuss in that respect probably only next week uh, entry deterrence by the incumbent, which is possible by the fact that this uh, incumbent moves first. Okay, uh, Stackelberg, uh, Heinrich von Stackelberg was a German uh, economist and wrote his uh, paper or wrote a book, I think in some in the early 1930s. And he invented this so-called Stackelberg model. And uh, we are doing the so-called quantity leadership model. It's pretty much like our Cournot model. Uh, and uh, what we do here is that we, assume that firms choose outputs sequentially. That is, the leader sets the output first. So you have now two firms and you call one the leader. And the leader is determined by the fact that he or she can determine its output first. And then after observing the output of the leader, the follower sets its output. Okay. Uh, and therefore, the firm, the, what is, uh, which is the leader, has what is called a leadership advantage, typically. Uh, if we were to allow for price leadership, it might even be a leadership disadvantage, as you would see in these models. But here, it's a leadership advantage. Because in these models with uh, quantity competition, uh, the leader can anticipate the follower's action and therefore manipulate the follower. And in order for this to work, uh, the firm must be able to commit to its output choice. I will explain that uh, and, and uh, the, the strategic uh, consequences this has and what, what strategic com commitment means and why it has value uh, a little bit later. Okay. 
So what we are doing here is just looking into the standard Stuckelberg quantity leadership model, which you probably or hopefully know from your from your undergraduate studies. Uh, what we do here with this two-stage game, okay, first stage leader sets uh, its uh, her uh, quantity, then follower sets her quantity, and then uh, uh, we get again this this. Uh, in a sense, the, the, the auctioneer who sets in the market clearing price. Uh, and we also solve that recursively. Again, with this auctioneer, we could solve that problem a la Krebs-Scheinkman, okay? So we don't want to discuss that at the moment. So, but what is very easy or very, very straightforward, our follower, we know already how this follower will react because we, in the, in the Cournot model, we already uh, uh, determined or derived the, the so-called best response or reaction functions. And now it's really in the literal sense a reaction function because here uh, it's just the reaction to the leader's actual quantity, which is already known, okay? And we derive this reaction function above where we know that the optimal output of the F is the follower uh, is just the reaction to the output of the leader, which is observable. And what the leader does, the leader takes into account the follower's reaction. Okay, what does this mean? The leader maximizes her profit by choosing her quantity, QL, and taking into account that this is nothing else than QF here, okay? Then QF. That this QF is nothing else as a function of its own output, okay? And this is then rather different from Cournot because there, uh, there was no reaction. There was only best responses and simultaneous interaction. And now what you can do here, <clears throat> I think I again did that already uh, in, in one note. I can show it to you here. Uh, you can just here, I, I put down the, the, the profit. If you just take the derivative here, uh, I just did it here because otherwise uh, it just uh, I just uh, don't manage to put it on this little space. If you take a derivative with respect to Q, you're just left with this P here. This is this. Then you take the derivative with respect to the second argument here. So you're left with, oh, perhaps I use a different color than to highlight this. Then. Okay, then you take the derivative with respect to the second argument, you're left with the first argument. Uh, you, you just have to take the derivative uh, of uh, P with respect to the aggregate Q and then you apply chain rule, which gives you then one plus R prime Q of L. So this is supposed to be R minus then C prime is nothing else than, than the marginal cost and this uh, strange sign is supposed to be a zero. And what you see now, I just rearranged it a little bit uh, and, and just uh, uh, expanded this, this, uh, this bracket here and multiplied. So what you get here is just P times Q, uh, L times P prime. Actually, that's where you have this one here, okay? Uh, this is nothing else than a marginal revenue. Then here, uh, you can put the marginal cost on the other side and you get some additional part here, okay? And, uh, in, in the standard uh, Cournot model, you would have, or, or as a monopoly model or in the standard Cournot model, you would have marginal revenue equal marginal cost. Here you get an additional factor. This additional factor, P prime is negative, but now R prime, the derivative of the, the slope of the, of, the, of the reaction function is negative, as you know. Uh, reaction functions in Cournot are downward sloping. Therefore, this is also negative, so you get a positive. Uh, uh, term here, put that on the other side, then of course it becomes negative, but that means your price has to be lower than if this term were, were absent, because you subtract something here. And that means the price, and this is just a general proof, uh, that the price under Stackelberg is lower than the price under Kuhn. Okay? That's, that's what we have here. And, uh, yeah. Hopefully uh, this was clear. If it was not clear, and if I manage to move on here, then uh, I just give you uh, uh, again an example with linear demand. 
Suppose here we have two firms with identical products and identical constant marginal costs. Uh, again, a simple example piece A minus BQ here. Uh, here, uh, aggregate output is just the function or the, the sum of individual outputs from above, because this is exactly the same example as we had above in the Kuno case. We know that QF is uh, A minus C over 2B minus QL over 2, so the slope of of the of the reaction function is minus one half. If the leader uh, produces one more unit of output, uh, the follower will produce one half unit of output less. Okay, and uh, then the leader's optimization problem is the same as we just had here. Uh, it's it's just Q, and this is nothing else than P. Okay, Q times P minus minus cost, and again here for the QF. We just substitute the reaction function. That's what's done in the next uh, in the next line. And now what we are doing is just taking a derivative with respect to QL. And uh, I, I just didn't didn't do that here. I just calculated the result, and the result is rather. Uh, you, you will have the chance to do that in in the assignments. Therefore, it's no need to do it here. <coughs> so. What you uh, have here is just the leader's output, which is larger than the follower's output, which is actually twice as much as the follower's output. And actually, hopefully you will remember, this is just a monopoly output. So with linear demand, the Stuckelberg leader exactly produces a monopoly output. The, the uh, follower produces half of that output. And what is interesting here, uh, this is more then is greater, this output is greater than the output in the Cournot model. And as I already showed you, the price therefore is lower uh, uh, than in the Cournot model. Okay, so what we see here compared to the Cournot model, uh, and this of course translates also in, in terms of, of profits, the, fo the leader makes a higher profit than on the Cournot, the follower makes a lower profit, but uh, consumers also gain from, from this uh, sequential structure because in order to, uh, in a sense, uh, push back the follower, in order to urge the follower to produce less, the, the leader produces more and this leads to higher aggregate output and therefore lower prices. Okay, good thing here, the sequential structure also for consumers. So consumers and leader gain, follower loses. But this is something probably you hopefully know already. Uh, we can also put that in terms of a very nice diagram. I like these uh, isoprofit lines. These isoprofit lines are just uh, the combinations of output QL and QF, which give uh, the same profit. That's why they call the isoprofit lines. They are, they are not like indifference curves, like uh, lines of equal utilities, but they are just lines of equal uh, profits and these are straightforward. Here is just uh, this given profit level pi L upper bar. Here you see just A minus C times QL. Uh, this is just substituted all from, from the profit here. Okay, uh, You just get already, you, you, you substituted here QL and QF from, from uh, and, and you just substitute the, the price here and uh, you substitute here just your inverse demand function, okay? And then you get this here. And uh, you solve that for QF. So you get QF as a function of QL, and you see here these isoprofit lines are just oh, uh, parabolas. How do you call it? I think this thing is a parabola, uh, which is up, uh, turned upside down here with the minus. Uh, and the square term here. And so what we have here is just our standard uh, kind of diagram we had also in, in terms of our Cournot model where we have the two reaction function, a reaction function of the leader, a reaction function of the, the follower. If we had Cournot, this C here would be our result because that's where the two reaction functions intersect. But <clears throat> Here we have Stuckelberg, and here you see one of these one of these uh, uh, isoprofit lines. I can also draw the isoprofit line, which applies in the Cournot case, because there you see uh, how the shape looks like. Here you see uh, the reaction function just 
uh, is uh, just there goes through uh, the, the the horizontal part uh, of of the of the uh, iso profit line because uh, given that firm two uh, this, this follower charge is 15 you want to reach uh, the highest uh, excuse me the lowest iso profit line you can reach and this is the one which just is tangent here at this point uh, at this horizontal line of course the maximum profit is reached here in a monopoly part okay so you would have uh, uh, a profit line here as well, so uh, profit is increasing if you go down towards here uh, these, these uh, abscissa, okay, and now the point is why do they look like this here, these, these uh, 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 and profit lines, what is clear, if you uh, move away from your reaction function, uh, you get a higher output that would mean a lower price and as you were in a maximum profit maximum here your profit would go down so in order to keep that profit constant your rival would also have to decrease uh, her capacity or her output and that would then again increase uh, the price and would keep your uh, profit constant okay that's how these iso profit lines work now the point is or what is interesting here uh, if you're the Stackelberg leader, you your constraint is what it's the followers. And I just uh, erase all these drawings again here. Your 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 constraint is just this red line, the followers, uh, you, the followers uh, reaction function. Okay, and you are looking for the output combination which leads maximum profit. That is, which uh, uh, yields the lowest potential. A potential uh, iso profit curve which still uh, matches this uh, uh, constraint and this is exactly what is that was is what is the case here okay uh, this is uh, it's just tangent uh, where the iso profit line is just tangent here to to the, the reaction function and this is this output actually by the way as I already told you this is uh, is uh, monopoly output here now what is interesting here about this Stackelberg result? Uh, actually, of course, uh, we already saw that the, the, the uh, leader's profit is higher than under Cournot, and of course higher than the than the uh, followers' profit. What we have to discuss is here is uh, why do we not get this, or whether this is credible. Uh, at all, or why we do not get this in 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 uh, Cournot, for instance? Why would you not, as one of the two firms in Cournot, if you if you uh, have a simultaneous game, you just would tell the other, oh, I really build up a very high uh, oh, capacity plant, okay, with this here, okay, with th with this monopoly output here, and you, you better only produce a little here, okay, build a lower plant. Now the point is, given uh, if you uh, were not committed to producing this output, if you can change your output uh, uh, in a later stage, of course it's optimal for you uh, if it's really the output or, or the choice of firm um, two this, to choose this 11.25, it would not optimal for you to, to, to produce this 22.5, but to go back to your to your reaction function and produce this output because you would see, okay, um, again, getting too much, you would reach a lower ISO profit curve. Okay, so the point is here, this is only credible, this solution, if you have to commit this to this output. And that's uh, uh, the, the, the problem we, we discuss uh, next, okay? So uh, actually, here's or just written what I just told you. It's crucial that the leader can uh, commit to its output choice. Without such commitment, firm two should ignore any stated intent by firm one to produce this 22.5 in this. Okay, you explain, oh, I will pr produce a lot, but it's not credible because it's in your best interest to produce if you really expect then uh, your, your rival, that's what we, we, we uh, drew here, uh, if you expect your rival to produce this low quantity to also reduce your quantity because that will lead to much higher prices. Remember, the, the Stackelberg price was well below the Cournot price. Okay, 
So how can you commit? That's a question. And here I just show you this. Uh, oh, I think I might even uh, increase it here. Uh, probably the most uh, important example in terms of commitment uh, uh, stated ever or in, in history. Uh, this is Cortes, uh, as you see here, I don't speak uh, Spanish, but it's when he arrived to Mexico, what did he do? How did he motivate uh, his soldiers? Actually, he just burned the ships. Okay, that means they, there was, it was not an opportunity for them uh, to, to, to move away, okay, to run away, to escape, because the ships were burned, so their only choice to, so, or their only chance to survive was to fight uh, as tough as they could, and they really were motivated, okay? That's what is called a commitment. Another uh, instance is also to burn the bridges uh, behind you so that you cannot retreat. So this is, uh, in, in terms of military history, how you commit. In terms of, of, uh, of our Stackelberg model, you might invest in additional capacity. That, that's the point already. Uh, if you build up a large plant and if you already have invested a lot, and it's clear you cannot use this plant for, for uh, where you uh, can... can uh, produce this vague sense, you cannot produce it, produce it or use it for other purposes, then this is a credible commitment. Okay? You might also already uh, place the stated output on the market. You might already have uh, contracts with certain, uh, with certain customers so that it's clear that you will really uh, put that uh, on the market. You might also have prior reputation that you always uh, fulfilled your, your, uh, your, your, your promises. Okay? So, and uh, that should become clear in the next part because we are going to discuss that uh, in, in, in uh, more details here. We will see how, and that's why this timing matters, how an incumbent, for instance, can build up uh, uh, some capacity, can have excess capacity even uh, uh, before a potential entrant enters and the entrant then knows that there might something happen which is not... Uh, rather profitable for, for, for the entrant uh, if, if it really enters, okay? And what we are going to do next is to look uh, into the behavior of uh, incumbents and their opportunities uh, to deter entry. That, that's what we are going to do. So the, the point is here, uh, what we saw is that there is a leadership advantage, okay? Uh, this leadership advantage uh, is, might also be uh, termed uh, slightly differently in terms of an incumbency advantage. So our incumbent, uh, the, the one firm which is active in a market and which is a large one, call it Microsoft, call it Google and so on, or call it Campbell Soup, which has a very large market share in tin soups. These are already in the market. And these firms might be able to somehow uh, restrict entry of other companies. At the same time, they might be able to restrict output by a large enough amount so that the prices rise, so they have market power. But the point is, uh, they are really giants in their industries. Think of the social networks and the Googles and so on. And they have a dominant position. And the question is, how are they able to keep these dominant positions. Why is it not possible that rivals uh, could compete away uh, the position of such firms? It might be existing rivals, so in terms of search engines, Microsoft uh, is a rival of Google in terms of their Bing uh, search engine, but uh, they hardly are, not, or they ha are hardly able to, to compete. And if you see you can make a lot of profits, uh, if, if you start a social network or, or some other things, why is it not able to, to, to enter profitably this industry? Okay, that's, that's an important point. Actually, uh, that's uh, what is currently a huge discussion in terms of antitrusts. So, and uh, the, the point is here, why is that the case? Because these firms with monopoly power might take deliberate actions in order to either eliminate existing rivals or prevent entry of new firms. In terms of, of the tech industry, uh, currently there is speak of, speaking of, of a kill zone, 
Okay, a kill zone, you would not want uh, to enter a uh, uh, Google search engine business with, as, as a business startup or something which, which Facebook does because they will uh, probably uh, very, or very soon will uh, remove you from a market just by making offers which are very, very similar than, than yours. Okay, uh, the problem here is uh, you will never know, actually, in, in terms of this Facebook, if if you have something which is similar. Like, suppose you are Snapchat. You came up with uh, a very nice idea that uh, come with what uh, young kids like because they they uh, they they take many pictures, and these pictures are not uh, something they want to have in the internet for forever. Uh, and you offer something which destroys these pictures after five minutes or something like that. Uh, if you do that as Snap, uh, what you can expect that uh, Facebook follows suit uh, at Instagram uh, rather soon, okay? But the question is that, is that something which is bad? Is it uh, something which uh, is just uh, a, a attempted at eliminating an existing in that respect rival and in that term it's predatory conduct, räuberisches Verhalten, Kampfpreissetzung in, in German. <clears throat> and if it's only uh, or if it is only profitable if the rival if the rival uh, uh, exits or is it also profitable as Facebook would say oh all our our comp uh, our our uh, consumers want to have that, and this is just an increase of the, the product value, in a sense, to them. So, and similar as if you invest in R and D to reduce cost, this is not profitable uh, or predatory because it's profitable also uh, in in uh, just for for uh, if you uh, uh, act unilaterally without taking into account. Uh, the effect on the on the rival. So here it's a problem uh, to really uh, identify policies or actions which are uh, predatory. And uh, final point here: monopoly power and market entry. Just a, a very small uh, few stylized facts about entry. Entry in industry is common, but entry is generally small scale. Think of just our restaurants. If we do not have a pandemic and our bars and so on. Uh, each year about one third of all the restaurants and, and bars go bankrupt and uh, they, they, they pop up uh, next week after one bank bankrupt, one entrepreneur, the next pops up. So we have a lot of entry. Uh, small scale entry is relatively easy, but most of these entries exit within five years. So 60% of these uh, entrants exit within five years. So the survival rate, as it is called, is rather low. Therefore, entry is highly correlated with exit. That's what I try to, to explain to you in terms of these restaurants. You always see uh, uh, restaurants opening up and then closing down and opening up again. Okay, uh, And this is not really consistent with a picture uh, being caused by uh, or entry being caused by excess profit. If you're more interested in that, Paul Cherovsky uh, wrote a very nice book on entry and several articles. Uh, I don't know whether he termed, uh, termed uh, uh, these, these or coined this term revolving door. It's like a revolving door. Uh, these firms, these small entrants, do not mani uh, 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 manage to really enter this industry. They don't manage to enter the, the hotel lobby. They just stick in the revolving door, move through it, and go, get, get out again. Okay? And this uh, probably uh, reflects repeated attempts to penetrate markets dominated by large firms, but firms are largely, largely uh, unsuccessful. You have many startups, but very few really get big uh, companies. And but uh, problem is, why do are they not successful? Is it due to the predatory behavior of of some some uh, incumbent? Like uh, we had the Luft, the famous Lufthansa Germania case. When uh, Germania, some, some, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, tried to enter uh, the business uh, uh, or f uh, enter flight connections between Berlin and, and, and uh, Köln Bonn, uh, uh, Lufthansa previously chose, uh, charged a price of, I think, 300 mark, it must have been longer, longer ago because it's, it's in mark, and, and uh, then uh, Germania offered 
the same uh, direction, the same flight at 99 mark. What was the reaction of, of Lufthansa? Of course, they also reduced their price to about 100 mark. And that, uh, in, in, in the end, uh, led to uh, the, the bankruptcy of Germania and it led to a, a decision by the Bundeskartellamt that, which forbid uh, Lufthansa to charge these low prices. But of course, it's also a problem because uh, the question is, Will that chill uh, competition uh, uh, if you uh, do not allow firms to choose uh, to charge low prices? Okay, so predation might be a problem, but we need to understand it in much more detail. And at least partly, we are going to understand it in terms of predatory pricing, limit pricing, uh, when we look into models like the Stuckelberg model, where then a leader invests in capacities. Okay, and that's, uh, again, I took more time than I thought. Uh, that's what we are going to do next week. Again, as always, I will be available for, for further questions in a WebEx chat. I once again thank you for being with me and uh, have a nice week. Bye.